he went to Swarthmore College. He got a PhD at Rockefeller while he was a medical student. He was clinical faculty at UCSF and a lab uh, faculty there for many years, attending on the wards, treating patients. Um, then he went into full-time research at CPMC, during which time he was working on many projects, including the projects that would become Prosetta. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Vishu Langapa. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, what uh, I'll do is sort of divide the talk uh, unevenly into three parts. Uh, we'll start with the science, but then as uh, 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 Kevin suggested, turn to some interesting, uh, let's call them epistemological problems. And then finally, I'll make some comments about uh, 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 Prosetta from a business perspective. Um, so I, I changed the title that Kevin had uh, come up with to a slightly different one because uh, I thought this I could fit in uh, a reasonable 45-minute presentation. Um, uh, and I thought, also, I thought it was a cute play on words, which will make sense to you, uh, hopefully, in a few slides. Uh, uh, so let me just start with a little bit of my background uh, that led uh, ultimately to what uh, we uh, are doing at Prosetta. Uh, and it started with my stumbling into the lab of this crazy German guy uh, who uh, uh, was working on stuff that I didn't really care about, but I said, this, this guy seems interesting. Uh, what the hell, I'll hang out with him for a few years while I'm in med school. So he was studying uh, protein synthesis and uh, uh, actually specifically uh, targeting and translocation of proteins across the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, and 40 years later, I'm still working on his stuff. Um, but uh, I'm still having fun. Uh, uh, we took that system that uh, uh, had allowed us to understand that very fundamental process in cell biology, and we applied it to other stuff. And one is the term that, that Kevin uh, chose for the, the title, but I'm not going to go into that today. Uh, in a nutshell, we believe protein folding is regulatable productively by the cell, meaning that a protein can fold this way or that way. If it folds this way, it has this function. If it folds that way, it has a completely different function, and the cell gets to choose. And we found examples of that, and we think we understand how to control that, at least at a very crude level. Um, OK, that's nice. Uh, but oh, I'm going in the wrong direction. Uh, uh, along the way, we discovered yet another phenomenon, uh, regulation of the ribosome membrane junction. And that started to get us thinking that maybe this cell-free system that I'll tell you a little about uh, had yet other secrets in store. Uh, and then a postdoctoral fellow came to my lab and said, what about viral capsids? They're supposed to self-assemble, and I understand you don't believe anything occurs spontaneously. Uh, so what, what do you think's going on there? I said, having a clue. Let's take a look. And that led to the most proximal uh, uh, driver of forming Prosetta, which was the discovery of a set of host enzymes that catalyze capsid formation, uh, distinct from the intrinsic propensity of capsid proteins to assemble together. Um, as someone uh, else once said, uh, uh, enzymes don't make anything happen that wouldn't happen anyway. They just change uh, uh, the kinetics uh, um, uh, of its happening. So. Um, uh, let me, I know we have a mixed audience, so I'm just going to very quickly run through some very basic concepts to make sure the engineers and the biologists are uh, on the same page. Okay, we got to deal with cells, and we get sick because our cells are sick, as de Duve famously said. Um, uh, it's the organelles where everything is actually happening at a functional level. Uh, there are proteins that encode, uh, that are encoded by genes, which uh, direct ultimately the phenotype cells display. 
Enzymes are proteins that do work uh, through catalysis. Allosteric sites are very interesting uh, sites on enzymes that trigger action at a distance, let's call it. Uh, biogenesis is the process by which things are made in cells. And for proteins, that's birth via a protein-making machine, we'll term the ribosome. And, and this is a very important point for what I'm going to talk about because why do we know so much about the ribosome? Because it's stable. 50 years ago, people were able to purify it and characterize it in ultimate degree. What if the ribosome fell apart the minute you tried to, say, the minute you broke a cell open, the minute you tried to purify it, what if it fell apart? Well, we still wouldn't know how proteins are made. And what we believe we have discovered through a somewhat serendipitous path, as I'll describe, is a set of assembly machines analogous to the machine for protein synthesis called the ribosome or analogous to the proteasome, which is its uh, uh, alter ego that degrades proteins back to amino acids. And the distinction is these assembly machines are extremely unstable. And if you try to purify them, they fall apart. And that's why no one has found them until now, we believe. And we've figured out two things. One, how viruses take advantage of them and stabilize them. Why? Because, as we'll see, uh, homeostasis involves things coming apart and coming together. You don't want it staying on because you may want to turn it off a millisecond later. The virus has one goal in mind, make as much virus or more virus and to hell with homeostasis. And therein lies an interesting uh, answer to a riddle I will pose uh, as we go on. OK, viruses, uh, what are they? Well, I'm not exactly sure. I don't know that anybody is. But uh, they have a genome. They're surrounded by a protein shell that protects that genome, <coughs> that nucleic acid genome. And that protein shell is termed the capsid. And I'll start my discussion of our science with the question, how does the capsid assemble? OK, what is homeostasis? It's the tendency of living systems to maintain uh, a balance, uh, which is optimal for survival of the organism at steady state and under one stress or another to, uh, to change. And of course, evolution is a very powerful uh, paradigm that you'll see the connection to uh, everything I'm talking about, and I'll bring it very explicitly to the question of evolution of assembly machines. OK, with that as a background, uh, uh, let's uh, just review some historical premises of anti-infective and other drug discovery. So you've got to know your target, especially if you're using a cell-free protein-protein interaction system. Um, uh, you've got to go after the enemy, the virus, the parasite, the bacteria, the cancer, the misfolded protein aggregate, whatever. What else is there to do but go after the problem? Uh, well, you know, speaking of problems, drug resistance is a huge problem, but uh, what can you do? Um, you know, we're running out of druggable targets, or are we? So imagine yourself walking in an orchard, you reach up, you pick the fruit. It's great until everybody's picked the fruit they can reach. There's plenty of fruit up there. It's just outside of your reach. Now along, you come with a ladder. Now maybe you can do something interesting. And I believe what we've done, or are in the process of doing, we are still preclinical. But I think we've got that ladder. You know, the next, uh, uh, someone was asking me, uh, and I said, uh, 2014 is going to be our year. But as I pointed out to somebody, my wife reminded me, you say that every year. And I say that's because it's true every year. Anyway, OK. So what about targeting the host? Well, but wait a minute. Host, that's me. Uh, won't that be toxic? And that's the riddle I want to come to in a few slides. Uh, so very high level overview of our platform. 
Uh, uh, one, it's a, a novel means of managing one of the huge challenges of modern biology. There's too much information. It's too complicated, and you can't tell uh, 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 the forest from the trees. So speaking of forests and trees, uh, there's been a lot of focus over the last decade or more in, uh, on the one hand, on proteins, proteomic diversity, it would be called, sort of like looking at the sea of green up in the forest canopy, uh, or in very precise chemical structure, high resolution uh, structural biology, uh, but in fact, very often, what you're really interested in is a slightly different set of questions, which is, look, if I want to get up into the tree to see what's over the next hill, it helps me to know there's three you know, trunks I can climb here, and, uh, and I don't really need to know a lot of that detail. And, uh, we view what uh, pathways of biogenesis, the way the cell makes stuff, makes itself as a, a critical piece to this. Okay, so uh, 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 another uh, critical theme that I will come back to uh, is that nothing in the cell, we believe, is spontaneous. Everything is ca catalyzed and connected to everything else. Um, and uh, okay, the conventional view would be that proteins are made and then they assemble into complexes of various sorts. Uh, our view is a bit different. Uh, we believe that even as the chain is born, just as we wouldn't uh, have a child and then say, okay, see you in 18 years when you can actually do some work, uh, actually the heavy lifting goes on at that point in some sense. Uh, so also, uh, well, after a fashion, uh, 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 so also the uh, nascent chain is when the cell starts working on its proteins and hands them off from one multi-protein complex, as we'll see, to another. And once a protein is made, then an assembly machine, a discrete but transient set of proteins, does something, and another assembly machine does something else, and so on and so forth until it's done, and then it's maintained in one state or another until its time is over, at which point it's degraded and homeostasis uh, is maintained. Okay, so a uh, uh, few other very quickly concepts uh, we, uh, or aspects of our platform. We use some, I would say, uh, off the beaten track methodologies. One is de novo protein synthesis. We think it is just wrong to take uh, a protein, express it recombinantly in one source or another, and then put it into the test tube you want to study it in. We believe that how a protein is made tremendously influences what it does. And again, I could go on for far longer than this talk to flesh that out, but I won't, I'll spare you. Uh, the second thing we do is uh, drug resin affinity chromatography, chromatography <clears throat> but in, a, in, in an interesting and unusual context that I'll come to. And it, it's led to what I like to call the great leap backwards, um, where we set up screens in a cell-free system that allow us to find the drug without having a clue what the target is advance the drug still without knowing the target. And when we have a suitably advanced small molecule, and as you'll see with the SAR now roughly uh, defined, attach it to a resin, use it as an affinity ligand to pull out the target. What is that target? And that's where some interesting surprises have come up. Uh, and we use functional reconstitution uh, to, uh, again, I like to call it a validation of the improbable. Wait a minute, let me get this straight. You think there are transient, labile, heterogeneous, multi-protein complexes that uh, uh, when I try to look at them, they fall apart so I can't see them. Uh -huh. Well, let's all hold hands, close our eyes, and I bet there's pink elephants dancing on our heads too. Well, the functional reconstitution allows me to uh, have confidence in that tentative conclusion and to build out from that and invest an enormous amount of energy into that seemingly implausible uh, scenario. 
uh, and uh, 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 the have gun will travel mindset. I got some very powerful tools. Uh, I look for an expert collaborator who is knowledgeable in that area because I don't. I'm not going to learn that area. Open-minded enough to take me seriously. Uh, and intellectually aggressive uh, and not afraid to take the data in a direction that, uh, uh, as one of my former colleagues uh, said to me, how come you discovered this and not Merck or Pfizer or whoever? I said, I don't know, maybe we're just lucky again and again and again. <laughs> Uh, so what I'll show you, uh, we'll focus uh, uh, initially on the viral work, but I will then ver very briefly touch on its application to bacteria, neurologic disease, oncology, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we believe this applies to all of biology. Okay, and uh, uh, what we're talking about is assembly machine dynamics, that is, there are normal assembly, assembly machines uh, in our cells, and a very back of the envelope calculation from the small number we've looked at leads us to hypothesize that there are at least 10,000 different assembly machines in the cell, uh, and that there is an interesting relationship between the normal assembly machine that we would have uh, in homeostasis and what happens when any one of several things occur. And we start, we found this from our initial focus on viral infection, but we have reason to believe, and uh, our early evidence, that environmental toxins, genetic mutations, developmental disorders, all result in tweaking of the machine uh, through altering signaling pathways and by other means, such that the normal machine is converted to an aberrant assembly machine. And that aberrant assembly machine, where the normal one was, what's it doing for us? We know that viruses, or I will show you evidence that viruses take them over. But what is it doing for us? Well, it's constructing physiological structures, signaling complexes, what have you. And now, uh, in the disease, uh, process, instead of making a physiological structure, you have a pathological one. And that's entirely governed by allosteric sites being occupied that cause some subunits to come on and others to go off. We believe that uh, the compounds we're finding, perhaps, and I would like to believe, because of the approach we took rather than we just got lucky, although I'll take that if I have to. Uh, that approach is detecting with astounding uh, 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 frequency allosteric sites. And those are the ways the cell regulates these transient multiprotein complexes. Having small molecules that do that is, is an interesting uh, starting point. OK, so here's the typical viral life cycle. Uh, you know, uh, again, a virus uh, which has its genome surrounded by the capsid and then typically a lipid uh, envelope with a, a glycoprotein in it, but the, there are lots of different viral families that follow that general theme to one extent or another, but uh, somehow, typically by binding to a receptor, the virus gets into your cell uh, and undergoes uh, fairly extensive uh, process, internalization, disassembly, replication, transcription, translation, and then towards the end of the life cycle, uh, uh, the capsid forms. And that black box has been historically viewed as occurring through self-assembly. Now it uh, uh, spontaneously forms. And you can think of the other examples of spontaneity. Uh, whether it's immaculate conception or uh, protein folding or whatever, uh, it is an interesting psychological need of humans to take a process that they, they haven't been able to figure out any further and say, well, there must be nothing in between. Uh, 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 anyway, just an observation. Uh, so what do we do? Well, uh, 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 when I, as a medical student, uh, 
uh, stumbled into uh, Gunter Blobel's lab uh, at Rockefeller, uh, uh, what he showed me was, hey, we're able to grind up cells, make an extract, throw it into a test tube, provide that test tube with energy, amino acids, and in fact, if one of those amino acids is radioactive, now the ribosomes in that extract will, and if you throw in a messenger RNA that you want translated, the ribosomes will jump on that and start making what's encoded by that messenger RNA. Oh, and the, since the amino acids are, include a radioactive one, you can track the protein that was encoded by the messenger RNA you wanted translated, and in, amazing things happen when you do that. And, uh, in the global lab, the whole role of signal sequences and targeting to the ER and signal recognition particle, interesting, a multi-protein complex that is essentially catalyzing targeting to one particular part of the cell, uh, was all figured out from that. And if you took the approach that is taken for most proteins today by most scientists of, okay, here's the protein I'm interested in. Now let me see you'd have missed all of that. And in fact, that was missed. And uh, I was struck as a young, impressionable graduate student how hard it was to explain to very sophisticated scientists that the re this course is before the era of cloning, you know, uh, g the genome, uh, you know, uh, sequence or anything. Uh, all they could say is, wait a minute, that's my protein. I've been studying that for 30 years. I don't see any signal sequence on that protein. And we would say because it's cut off before the protein finishes being made while it's still on the ribosome. You're not looking at that step. That was incredibly difficult to convey. Uh, anyway, make a long story very short. Uh, we programmed this reaction with a viral capsid encoding messenger RNA. And surprise, surprise, uh, we made viral capsids with that one messenger RNA added. And you know, here's what we made in the cell-free system. Here's the real deal. Good heavens, they look alike. They're biochemical, their biophysical properties are alike. And when we studied the process, we go through very discrete intermediates. And when it was studied in greater detail in the next several years uh, in the, uh, the academic lab, uh, we found not only were there discrete assembly intermediates that had been missed by everybody, but there were energy dependent steps and machinery dependent steps that if you, fra if you deplete the energy or fractionate the extract, this would stop. That doesn't sound like self-assembly to me. Uh, and in fact, uh, my postdoc, who triggered this whole direction of work, uh, showed that host proteins would come on, do work, then leave, building the capsid. And that's when I said, wait a minute, every one of those host enzyme viral capsid interfaces is a potential novel antiviral drug target. And then I had the first of many lucky breaks. This postdoc was my little sister. So I said, I tell you what, you want academia, you go take that academic position at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I will retire from academia and start the company. Because if people in the field are having this much trouble understanding what we were saying, and uh, we had the grant rejections to prove it. Uh, but it was OK, because our other programs kept us funded, but it was still pretty annoying. Uh, and I, I, it occurred to me that if they're having this much trouble understanding, that's a bad thing from the point of view of getting your grants funded and doing your science. But from a business perspective, it's the ultimate barrier to competition. Ah, I see how I can turn this lemon into, a, into lemonade. OK, excellent. So she went off. She's still on the faculty, now a full professor, hopefully enjoying uh, her academic uh, life, uh, whereas I'm having a blast at Prosetta. So what did we find? Well, again, in a nutshell, we developed some screens to interrogate this uh, pathway 
Uh, and with the, with the thinking being, look, I'm either right or I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, great. The world is rid of one nuisance, and I'll never bother anybody again. But if I'm right, then we come back armed with some very interesting tools, among other things. Uh, so uh, we found some stunning stuff. Yep, we ran the screen. We got hits. We uh, uh, sent those hits to academic leaders in virology. And uh, one who was an expert in Flavi Verde, the family that includes both hepatitis C, yellow fever, dengue, West Nile, a number of viruses, many of which there's nothing you can do about uh, um, still. Uh, uh, they came back to us with a stunning report, which was our compound from a hepatitis C screen was extremely potent. Here we're looking at log drop in viral titer in cell culture in the nanomolar range. We're getting, and this is a hit straight out of the library, we were getting very potent activity, but with a very interesting property. It worked on every member of family Flavi Veridae uh, tested seven total, had no effect on a coronavirus or a rhabdovirus, different viral families. And from the perspective of, well, if you're hijacking host factors, who do you think your cousin's going to hijack? Probably the same host factors. It made sense, but it was something we hadn't appreciated. Um, the other interesting implication about targeting a host factor is Wait a minute, how is the virus supposed to develop resistance since you're not targeting the virus? There shouldn't be selection pr pressure for uh, resistance. And the host factor you're targeting, as we'll see, if it's a multi-protein complex and if it's the first step in a very programmed pathway, you can't just switch in the middle. You've committed yourself to what that uh, uh, step is going to hand off to, and what you need to hand off, imagine an assembly line. Uh, somebody passes out in the middle of the assembly line, you can't just say, oh, just ship this off half built. Uh, now, maybe the people in the assembly line will cheat, and they'll say, just skip his step. No one will notice. Well, <laughs> uh, that, it turns out, is what happens when you block these steps. One of the stunning features of uh, what we found is, as a general rule, not entirely, we have some exceptions, but as a general rule, the compounds we are finding don't block the production of viruses, but the virus that's produced is completely non-infectious. And when you now look at its capsid, you touch it and it crumbles. Someone forgot to tighten the screws, or forgot even to put in the screws. Interesting. And that, of course, has, interesting, has implications that we hope will be tested next month at the CDC when they take our very potent rabies virus compound uh, and, immuni and uh, 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 treat rabies inoculated mice with them. And we'll see whether not only will we uh, 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 rescue the mice from rabies, but perhaps uh, uh, we will uh, have developed an immune response to the aberrant capsids that were produced. Ultimately, it clears, but uh, there is that transient phase where you're making non-infectious virus, it can't spread, and it gives time for the immune system to clean up the mess. Uh, you know, you could imagine a, uh, you know, an alien vessel coming from outer space, but if uh, in the tr uh, transit, the uh, doors got rusty and their keys don't work, and they're stuck in there. Now small children laugh at them on the way to school, and it's an interesting novelty. Okay. Oh, and we know this is in principle applicable not just as a cell culture uh, artifact, because uh, uh, with a government contract uh, uh, that we had, we worked with our colleagues at uh, Fort Detrick, USAMRID, uh, uh, to take one of our compounds from our Ebola screen and take that into my, mice and show uh, that uh, the uh, uh, control group exposed to 1,000 LD50s of mouse-adapted 
Ebola virus are all dead of uh, Ebola hemorrhagic fever in 10 days. Uh, the experimental group treated with our compound once a day for four days had full recovery uh, return to uh, health. Uh, so that uh, said to us, we're on the right track. Uh, we need to just broaden our approach. And this is an example of progression of a chemotype where you take a, an initial hit, which has some activity, but not great, uh, therapeutic index of 10. Well, I guess it's better than Tylenol, which is like two. But uh, you know, one likes to have a therapeutic index of about 100, let's say. Uh, and by doing structure activity relationship optimization, you can make it better and better. And so our flu program is, has reached uh, a, a, a therapeutic index of 100 for a number of different chemotypes, and those will be going into animal uh, trials shortly with a contract we have with uh, um, a, a large pharma. Um, so. What's our approach to target identification? Well, you take an active compound, and you notice it has, that is, that came out of our screen, a hit, if you will. It has a number of different functional groups. You make analogs in which you change individual functional groups. And of course, that allows you to make it better and better. But in the course of doing that, you also learn what groups you can change and neither got better nor worse. And you take that one, and you now make it into an affinity ligand, stick it on a resin. And now you can fish out what that drug is targeting. Now here, you can do it in a couple of interesting ways. Uh, well, first, let me just finish. The, OK, so the target binds. But now we observed something <coughs> stunning, which is once the target binds, it seems to change its composition. Ah, that's where we said, oh my gosh, these must be allosteric sites that are regulating assembly machine composition. We end up with the one that the, the allosteric site in question governs. And different ones will give us different sets of patterns from a related chemotype. Very interesting. Okay. So now let us pose the riddle that I started with. How do you target the host without toxicity? And I have two answers. I think both are true. I, at the moment, don't know how they are related. They may be related or they may not be. It could be more than one right answer. OK. So one approach is if you uh, uh, take uh, uh, those eluates from the drug columns and run them on a gradient that separates them out and then look at those proteins. This is a silver stain uh, of an eluate after running it on a gradient that separates it by, by size of complex. And then you look at the composition of, uh, every, of each fraction on a gel. What you find is only the fraction that has all of the components. Notice it's falling apart before my eyes, even you know, kept at four degrees. As I'm running the eluate on a gradient, it's coming apart. Uh, uh, and we've shown that's because as you run the gradient, the free drug is left behind that you eluded it from the drug resin with. And the bound drug is a very, very small fraction Eventually, with equilibration, given whatever its off rate is, it comes off, and now the complex falls apart. Uh, only this fraction works in the functional reconstitution I have, which is very simple. I've got this cell-free extract that recreates capsids that I showed you. <clears throat> what if I take away the target? It shouldn't make the capsid anymore. Yep, we showed that. And if I now take this eluate, remove the free drug, and add it back, makes it again. So I know, uh, and it on, only the fraction that has all the bands does that. So I know it wasn't really, let's say, just this protein and all the others are just garbage. No, I need them all to get that back. And you can use chemical cross-linking to identify the nearest neighbor proteins to the drug and show that 
in the one example, only two of those 20 proteins are actually uh, in close proximity to the drug. So you can use some fairly powerful tools to identify the target, and the answer is uh, uh, not what one would have expected. Uh, now, you can do this same experiment in a slightly different way that leads to a absolutely mind-boggling conclusion. So n this time, let us take a brain extract, run that on a gradient, and then Western blot for one of the proteins in that complex. And uh, what you find is uh, that protein is everywhere. And in fact, it has post-translational modifications that make it, it's, it is heterogeneous like crazy. And you can take each of these gradient fractions, you can dilute them, rerun them on a gradient to show it wasn't just a smear of garbage everywhere. No, uh, fraction uh, four reruns to fraction four. Fraction eight reruns to fraction eight. Uh, uh, you're running it on a gradient that's separating by size. And if they are different sized complexes, they would run in different fractions. OK? Now, got, hold, bear with me. This will all be clearer in a moment when I flash up the cartoon that converts this unintelligible uh, 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 bit of uh, uh, Western blot into. Uh, something uh, uh, more meaningful. When we now take each of these fractions and put them on the drug resin, so that's the other way around. Here, I started with the drug resin, then ran the gradient on just the eluid. Let's do it the other way around. First run the total brain extract on the gradient and put each frax fraction on the resin. Stunningly, only fraction three is binding. Wait a minute. So here's this protein that was present in the, the eluid. It, it is present everywhere, but only the subfraction in fraction three binds to the rabies drug column. So what's going on? Well, that one protein that I Western blotted for it is present in all sorts of different complexes. Some of them are small. They're at the top of the gradient. Some of them are enormous. They're at the bottom of the gradient. They're very heterogeneous. Now, here's the problem. If you kill this protein, that's bad for you. You're the host. That's your protein. But it's involved in 100 machines. If you, could, if you had a way of finding the needle in the haystack, the one assembly machine that rabies virus needs that has that protein, and could selectively stop that one and leave the other 99 alone, toxicity would certainly be less. I don't know if I'm making any sense. Uh, this, so what the implication of this is, is the cytoplasm is far more heterogeneous with regards to multi-protein complexes than we generally appreciate. Why has that not been appreciated? Because they fall apart, as shown here. And if you could select the needle in the haystack, you'd have an interesting drug. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, that's what we are getting with our biogenesis-based screen. Maybe it's a coincidence, but it's happening again and again and again. OK. so. Second answer to the riddle. And for this, let me start by highlighting uh, Bruce Alberts's very prescient article uh, uh, talking about the cell as a collection of protein machines and saying, you know, molecular biologists need to start thinking about this problem. Well. Here's what uh, our data, and I'll summarize a lot of data to say, OK, there's all the proteins in the cell. They're not just willy-nilly floating around. They're organized as assembly machines, and there's lots of them. What happens when the virus infects the cell? It comes in, and it says, will all assembly machines please stand up? It looks, you, 
You look like you could assemble my capsid. Come over here, my multi-protein complex that I call the capsid. Let's try you out. And then a cruel smile comes over its face. And it says, I got some good news for you and some bad news. The good news is you can assemble my capsid. So I'm very interested in you. The bad news is you're following some program called homeostasis? I don't think so. So I'm going to take you and I'm going to poke out your eyes and I'm going to rip off your arms and his are bigger. We'll put his on and I will change you from the normal assembly machine that's transient, that's falling apart all the time, that's doing what the host wants it to do into the aberrant assembly machine that does what it's told by me. But therein lies the virus's Achilles heel because that aberrant assembly machine, even though it's made of your host proteins, isn't doing you any good. And it's different from yours, which means you should be able to tune in a small molecule that works on your assembly machine to a less and less toxic and more and more potent analog that gets the virus's assembly machine. And that's what we are able to do. And uh, so those aberrant assembly machines represent novel drug targets. Uh, because these are host factors, not viral enzymes, ugh, the virus is not uh, able, it appears, to develop resistance, or at least not easily. We've not seen it. Uh, and since those aren't helping you, those aberrant assembly machines, kill them. Okay. So, uh, and this just shows you the kind of experiment that, really simple experiment, it's like I kick myself. Why didn't we think of doing this five years ago? You know, I've learned in science, just look forward, don't look backwards. Uh, so if you simply take an uninfected cell and an infected cell and put that on the drug resin, what you find is the complex, the multi-protein complex has changed. Here's a protein that comes on in the infected cell's aberrant assembly machine. Here's one that diminishes. Here's one that stays absolutely the same. OK, so what is an assembly machine? <clears throat> well, uh, we actually, as I uh, gave you the example, the ribosome is an assembly machine of sorts. It polymerizes amino acids covalently. Uh, a proteasome is uh, the reverse of an assembly machine uh, uh, for a fashion. The interactomes that the systems biologists talk about, uh, many of those are together. They just don't know it because when you try to purify it, they don't come together. Uh, and so on and so forth. We believe these assembly maintenance machines are part of that universe. And this is a very interesting way of approaching that universe. OK, so to end the antiviral part uh, 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 of the talk, um, uh, which is most of it, don't worry, it's not going to go on forever. Uh, uh, here is every family of virus that causes human disease. And uh, in all except three families that I'm still trying to get someone to send me the damn capsid gene for, they're so obscure, you know, what is an uh, anelovirus? I don't even know. I think it causes diarrhea in Bangladesh or something. But uh, whatever, it, it, uh, every virus that I bet you can think of, we have expressed in our system shown assembly of a putative capsid, identified a distinctive pathway, so much so that you show me the pathway, I can tell you what one or two viral families it is. They are very distinctive. Uh, we've established screens, validated the hits we've found against infectious virus in cell culture, and shown uh, uh, at least a minimal structure activity relationship improvement. So we believe this applies to all viruses, but now, comes the really fun part. OK, so that's moving forward. We've got now uh, partnerships with three large pharmas. Uh, Bristol Myers Squibb is working on a novel HIV drug with us. Uh, uh, the animal di division of Eli Lilly on another uh, set. Uh, AstraZeneca just started a partnership with us on uh, uh, another program. 
But now comes the really fun part. Where do assembly machines come from? Not out of thin air. And in fact, uh, some of the best antibiotics against bacteria target what? The bacterial ribosome. Wait a minute, I just made an analogy between ribosomes and these assembly machines, except those are stable, these are transient. You're able to target the bacterial ribosome without hurting us. Why? Because of evolutionary distance. Their ribosome is different enough from ours that no problem. Analogous to the aberrant versus normal assembly machines, but not just virally modeled, modified assembly machines. What about evolutionarily diverse assembly machines? Well, who'd have thunk it? We took our collection of antiviral drugs and we screened them against gram negative and gram positive bacteria and found some that are hitting both. And against every antibiotic resistant strain we could find, including some dirt uh, uh, from the homeless shelter on Fifth Street. And it's active against all of those things. Hmm, this could be interesting. Uh, uh, so, well, let's take, so anyway, we are now uh, in discussion with various uh, partners on parasite and uh, antibacterial programs uh, and plant programs. So it turns out, uh, I didn't know this, uh, uh, there's a pseudomonas that's wiping out the kiwi crop in New Zealand. So we sent 11 compounds to them and four of them are as potent as the best thing they've got now and that's straight out of the library with no SAR done yet. So there's some interest uh, in New Zealand uh, in that, we'll see. Uh, I showed you this slide a few slides ago. The, the notion that whatever, what, what do viruses do? Well, they take advantage of all the weak links in our biology. And how did they figure that out? Well, what's their generation time? Two hours. What's ours? 20 years. Uh, they've run a billion years of evolution in the short span of human evolution. They've figured out all of our weaknesses, all the weak links. And amazingly, and here's where my title comes from, assembly is the low-hanging fruit for them. That's where things come together. I mean, if you have a genetic lesion that's really serious, until the modern era, you wouldn't make it. You'd be dead. Uh, uh, an assembly defect is the kind of thing that can happen you know, as you age. Uh, it's something that a virus can say, hey, if I just hit this wall right here, the panel opens and I can rewire things. Well, if the virus can do that, an environmental toxin, a genetic mutation, a developmental disorder could do the same thing. So I was on a train in uh, Germany with a collaborator of ours, and he was going on and on about his work on A-beta oligomerization and Alzheimer's disease. And I said, Karsten, Karsten, stop, stop. Every time you say aggregation, I wince. Because for 20 years, the virologists have been telling me my assembly intermediates are just aggregates. They're crap. And I said, wouldn't it be a hoot if it's the other way around? What you guys call aggregates are really assembly intermediates in signaling <laughs> complex formation? And he said, now you, you know, you're really gone nuts. I think you, you must be off your meds. You know, uh, that, that, that's, this is crazy. I said, but wait, 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 just hear me out. It's a very simple experiment. I, you know, a, another one of my psy psychiatric lesions you just saw a moment ago. Wait a minute, focus. What do you mean focus? Every viral family I can get my hands on. I said, I've got a set of compounds that work on all those different viral families. I can send you 30 small molecules. You test them in your cell culture assay on A-beta oligomerization. I make a very simple prediction. If viruses are, as I'm more and more thinking, the bloodhounds or truffle hounds of evolution. I can use the antiviral drugs as the starting point for drug discovery of everything. Now, it, with, with, with some caveats, of the 30 antiviral drugs I send you, I make a prediction that 25 won't do anything. But five of them will include some that are very potent. Okay, so.
this is very interesting. So he runs his cellular model of A beta oligomerization, uh, where here is the, the control. And sure enough, uh, 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 actually, this is the more advanced uh, slide, looking at an SAR profile of one of them. Out of the 30, OK, I was almost right. Three out of the 30 were active. 27 had no activity at all. And the three that were active were active in double-digit nanomolar uh, EC50. Not bad for a first shot. OK, we then took the active compound and uh, uh, did a not exactly a massive SAR profile, and we saw something quite stunning. Uh, sure enough, there's an analog that uh, at six nanomolar essentially eliminates uh, A beta oligomerization. But interestingly, there's another analog that actually makes it dramatically worse. Now, I'm not proposing a bioweapon or anything of the sort. Uh, this is valuable as a as a molecular tool to understanding the biology because this says I'm getting agonist and antagonist. I really am hitting a very interesting allosteric site because not only am I changing the polypeptide composition that composes the assembly machine, I am skewing it in one direction versus another. And uh, when we showed this to one of the uh, 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 experts in the nation on uh, Alzheimer's, uh, he said, well, this is very interesting, but you know, the A-beta oligomerization uh, assay, which Selco developed at Harvard, nobody believes any of that crap at Harvard, uh, I say to an MIT audience, uh, 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 no one believes that anymore. Now, show me A-beta 42. Well, we did the A-beta 42, ELISA, and it's stunning, just as stunning a spread with this uh, uh, set of SAR compounds. That compound is selectively blocking A beta 42, not A beta 40, and doesn't touch gamma secretase. So it's not working via the classic active site inhibitors. Uh, again, it's working on an allosteric site of an assembly machine that nobody knows about. Interesting. Okay. Uh, oh, and the same set of compounds show a completely different SAR. So the active ones are very different uh, from the active ones in this spread, uh, ordered in the same order, uh, for rabies virus. Very interesting that that's a neurotropic virus. Okay, so the conventional view is therapeutics through blockade of aggregate formation or promoting dissolution. Our hypothesis is therapeutics by reestablishing homeostasis. Abolish the aberrant machine that is the basis for functional dysregulation. And we've shown when we take these cells that are making the A beta oligomers, treat them with our drug. Now, these cells are mutant because they've been transfected with the human mutant uh, in familial Alzheimer's disease. We're able to normalize the uh, assembly machine um, uh, uh, by treatment with our compound. <coughs> OK, is it just Alzheimer's? Well, DISC1, the disrupted in schizophrenia complex, is a gene product implicated not only in schizophrenia, uh, but in depression, in post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, in addiction, uh, uh, and uh, uh, in a cellular assay that measures uh, DISC-1 aggregation, we find that our assembly blocking small molecules eliminate the aggregates. Uh, and they came out of our cell-free screen for small molecules that uh, block the aberrant assembly machine formation. So, uh, oh, I forgot to take away the question mark. To tell, I wanted to have this a more Positive statement. Many path forward? No. We, uh, uh, anyway, take away the question mark. That's what happens when you change the slides at the last minute. So there are many directions we can take this. We can drill down on mechanism, identify these targets. We can take it into animal efficacy. That's happening uh, next month at the uh, Buck Institute for Aging uh, uh, here in Novato. Um, 
Uh, we can advance the compounds through SAR. Again, we've done a small amount of SAR, but a very small amount. Uh, we can develop antibodies, we're doing that now, to the aberrant assembly machines as novel biomarkers, uh, which of course would allow you to stratify clinical subsets, correlate to disease, and all of this would feed into clinical trials in a very interesting way. One of the problems with disease today where you have many different molecular mechanisms causing a disease, your drug that targets one or two of those 12 mechanisms, you'd better have the right patients in your trial. Here's a way to pre-select the patients to say, I don't have a drug for all Alzheimer's. I have one for aberrant assembly Alzheimer's. Who has that? Those are the ones we would be able to target and so on and so forth. And if we're right that there are 10,000 assembly machines in the cell and uh, whatever, a dozen of them are invo involved in Alzheimer's, it may be a substantial fraction of the Alzheimer's population, for example, or the schizophrenia, depression, addiction uh, subset, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's the end of the science part, per se. I, wanna just, I just have a couple of slides on the other parts, but maybe it'll give uh, 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 something to apply everything I've just talked about to. So uh, uh, I'm fascinated by the human psychological need for certainty, which includes the myth of spontaneity. Because if it's not spontaneous, then there's something I don't know, and I don't know how to know, and that's scary. So nope, just happens. Uh, uh, John Dewey, uh, his classic book, uh, Quest for Certainty, is a brilliant exposition of uh, that historical uh, flaw. Uh, uh, we found thought experiments, such as we carried out with my uh, colleague uh, on the train in Germany, uh, as really powerful heuristic devices to run through 100 experiments uh, in thought before you settle on the one to actually do, and it increases the yield of those experience, experiments enormously. Uh, I think this is a huge flaw in science today, which is most scientists believe that history ends with them. <laughs> and this is now the truth, and there was all that crazy stuff that people used to believe, but now we know, and it's been very interesting, humbling, I would say, in my 40-year or 30-year, uh, 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 well, geez, it's more like getting closer to 40, ouch, uh, 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 you know, uh, academic medical career to see myth or truth after truth exploded as myth in a matter of just a few years. Um, uh, and so I think recognizing that and being open to questioning anything, but recognize the flip side of the coin. If you question everything, you'll never get anywhere. So, you know, whoa boy, okay. Uh, I, and science, you know, uh, it's got its problems, uh, but uh, the matrix cannot tell you who you are. Um, and, you know, reality, again, this goes back to Dewey, uh, is very fluid and it's dependent on the perspective of the observer much more so than is appreciated. I like to use the analogy, uh, imagine you're on a desert island. Let's forget how you got there, and you're hoping desperately for rescue, but you know, that hot sun, uh, you may not make it until then. And then, bizarrely, out of the sky falls a refrigerator. Luckily, not on you, but you know, uh, not far from you. Uh, you run up, you open it, it's dented, but so what? It, you open it, and it's full of cold drinks and food, and. Uh, you are able to weather the, the, the rigors until you are rescued. Now, imagine that happening to a Neanderthal. What he sees is, I'm glad that rock didn't, that funny looking rock didn't hit me, and he runs in the other direction, and his bones are found by the rescue party some days later. The reality is incredibly dependent on the tools, on the, uh, 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 you know, the background information, on the you know, what is thought of as being worthy of looking at uh, on so many things. Okay, so there, that's my uh, 
food for further discussion if anybody's interested. Uh, let me now just say a few words about the Presetta business model, which is a hoot in its own right. Um, so uh, uh, we're unusual. Uh, we have, uh, at the moment, uh, you know, never say never, but we've chosen not to take any venture capital. Uh, it allows us to be quite crazy without anybody saying that's not the way you're supposed to be. No, we can do whatever we want. Uh, uh, and, we, uh, and science has been the fundamental driver for a number of decisions. So for example, uh, uh, I was severely criticized uh, by, in many quarters, saying, you've got to focus. Choose one virus and focus on that. You'd be done already if you'd done that. Well, yes, if I had put, made the right bet. At the time when we started, hep C, hands down. That's the one to focus on. No one's interested in hep C now. Now, you could say, well, maybe we would have gotten there sooner. But if we didn't, and uh, part of why we know what we know now is the many different viruses we've studied, which has really given us this survey of all of human biology in a very interesting uh, way. So uh, I am sure, I know that the thought leaders in the field uh, that uh, you know, uh, let's say a venture fund might have brought to uh, correct our behavior would have focused us on probably on failure. To our shock of the three commercially major viruses, the one that Bristol Myers Squibb chose was HIV. And it's like, wait a minute, there's already plenty of HIV drugs. That I didn't expect that. I thought, at least flu. Nope, HIV. So had we made a gamble, we probably would have gambled wrong. Very few people were saying, you got to focus on an HIV drug. Everyone was saying, there's plenty of them out there. Why are you doing that? I don't know, but that got us the partnership that saved us a few years ago um, and is advancing nicely. Uh, we have a very low overhead. Um, again, you'd be amazed what you can do. We found a biotech going bankrupt uh, in Maryland, we dis disassembled their, we bought their benches, disassembled them, uh, drove them across country, and <laughs> reassembled them on, on Fifth and Townsend here uh, for 10 cents on the dollar. Uh, I don't know any uh, biotech uh, doing drug discovery for a tenth of what, uh, you know, we're doing it for a tenth of what uh, anybody else is. And this notion of sometimes it's actually useful to not be focused, to to you know, keep eggs in many baskets for as long as possible. You learn all sorts of stuff if you know how to harness that. Uh, so this is another interesting thing. And since Kevin was so kind as to uh, speak fondly of me, uh, I assure you no money changed hands. Uh, 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 about teaching, uh, we've had a very interesting experience at Rosetta. So. Uh, the City College of San Francisco has a, uh, a program, the Bridge to Biotech, which uh, provides a means for people who've lost their jobs in one field or another to say, uh, let me retrain in biotech, uh, get a, an associate's degree or whatever, and they then place them in internships. And I think uh, Genentech takes one or two every year, and Amgen takes one or two, and Prezetta takes about 30. <laughs> Okay, uh, not all at once, but you know, five or six a semester, uh, you know, uh, and uh, uh, you know uh, they get uh, weekly lectures from me, from our other senior scientists. Uh, uh, you know, we uh, give them projects that, you know, I had many graduate students at UCSF. Uh, uh, most of whom actually got their PhDs, and uh, these would be prime thesis projects if they were to stay long enough to do that, but they're really exciting projects. And what that has allowed us to do is identify a small number of people who you never would have found otherwise. Uh, someone who used to be a printer, he lost his job as a printer, and he's one of the best people I've got. He's very good at certain kinds of things. And I think he works all night. We rarely see him during the day. But uh, 
His data is stunning and has allowed us to advance some things we couldn't have otherwise. And projects that others had tried and failed, he found tweaks that made it work and that have generalized it that everybody is using it in the company now. Uh, another uh, a Hurricane Katrina survivor who uh, was a short order chef and, and you know retrained. She's a work machine. She's my right hand woman in terms of running sucrose gradients. So we're able to, you know, I pride myself on, I've run 40 in a day. You know, she holds the record at 65. I, I'm too old for that. But uh, 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 you end up, so we have had very little turnover. We have people that are fiercely loyal, that are loving what they're doing, and the wretched salaries we pay, they're happy with. What's to argue with that? So another principle is, I, I, you know, I look at pharma, I look at uh, whatever, I find, oh my God, uh, I look at academia, same problem I saw at UCSF. Uh, the heads of the labs are spending all their time, you know, writing grants and giving talks. They're not doing science anymore. And yet they came to their position in part because of their uh, uh, incredible scientific skill. I saw that. Uh, firsthand when you know I stumbled into Gunter Blobel's lab and he taught me cell-free protein synthesis with his own hands. And at two in the morning when I was puttering around some, who is that coming into the lab? It's Gunter to take down his sucrose gradients. Because that's before he became famous. Once he became famous, I was witness to the, his stumbling around trying to do an experiment by, oh, let me borrow your reagents, let me borrow your, when you do that, it never works, okay? Uh, and giving up in frustration. And uh, 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 so there is this enormous pressure, whatever area you're in, to give up what made you a scientist, an experimentalist. And we believe that is a fatal flaw. And I see that in pharma when the senior person now tells the next layer, the next layer, the next layer, and what it gets translated to at the end of the game of telephone is a farce compared to what was intended. Uh, and I believe that that is not unconnected to that dissociation. And to have the head chemist in one of the farmers, I won't say which, uh, brag that he hasn't done a chemical reaction in 20 years. I can assure you the head of our chemistry department does chemical reactions on a regular basis. Uh, and not in everything. In fact, the Lingapa gun test, this, as you can imagine, endeared me to my colleagues at UCSF. I said, take the head of a lab, put a gun to their head, and say, with your own hands, do any one thing you're known for. Not everything, just one thing. I can still survive. And I believe that, and all of our team leaders can. And that's something, it's not easy, but it's something that's extremely important, keeping the science in tune with what's going on uh, in the, the larger enterprise. Uh, and I've already uh, uh, talked about uh, the barrier to entry of when people don't understand what the heck you're doing and how you're doing it. Uh, uh, we believe we have uh, an intellectual property franchise with application to every area of biology, and it'll be very difficult to, for, there, uh, as far as I am aware, I have never heard of someone taking our approach. Nobody does what I do, what I've taught our uh, group anymore. Uh, that's a bygone era. Just buy a kit. You can't do this, these kinds of experiments with commercial kits. Okay, so there we are, the corner of 5th and Townsend. Uh, that's actually the 5th Street side. Um, and I think I'll stop there, uh, open it to any questions uh, you may have. Yes, Rob. <laughs> Um, tell us about prion diseases. That's okay, about the so only thing you haven't cured yet. 
Yeah, so uh, actually, we have small molecules that completely eliminate uh, infectious prion disease. Uh, uh, my collaborator in Germany uh, did his postdoc with Stan Prusner, developed some of the early weak small molecules uh, uh, on prion disease. He says that our molecules are like nothing he's ever seen, eliminated in the single digit nanomolar range. Uh, however, my perspective on prion, and, I, and I've, you know, I'm a collaborator of Stan Prusner's. We've published many papers together. Um, I take a different perspective. I believe prion diseases have been misunderstood. They're viewed as this weird biology that, you know, like from the, the Mars or something. But I think, in fact, they are a manifestation of positive feedback control. And, you know, we think usually of feedback as negative feedback. That's the classic homeostatic model, but there are very dramatic physiological examples of positive feedback. I think the menstrual cycle is the one that uh, Kevin may remember the lectures I gave on that, uh, 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 you know, is a stunning example of that. But there are other examples in biology. I believe uh, this, uh, that that is what prion disease is. So what we have shown, and in some of our work with Stan, is that, well, actually, you can go to work that's neither ours nor Stan's. Uh, Adriano Aguzzi uh, uh, in Europe has shown that if you take a knockout mouse that has no endogenous prion gene, transplant into its brain a chunk of normal mouse brain, you uh, inoculate it with infectious prions, the, that mouse doesn't get sick, as a number of groups have shown, but the transplant gets infected, generates prions, et cetera, meaning you need the endogenous prion gene. Now, what we have shown, and I mentioned this at the very outset, this concept of bioconformatics, regulated protein folding. We've shown that the prion protein that we all have right now, I'm assuming none of you uh, have incipient Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, uh, 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 ha comes in at least three conformers with different functions. One of them protects us from oxidative stress, and I hope that's the dominant conformer in all of our brains at the moment. The s second one is a trigger of uh, neurogenesis early in development, and we've shown that uh, in neuronal cell cultures. And the third is a trigger of apoptosis, programmed cell death, which is turned on by infectious prions, quote unquote. So I believe that what you're looking at, it's called infectious prions, but it's positive feedback control. Uh, you know, uh, 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 if insulin were under positive feedback rather than negative, you'd say, I have an infectious agent of hypoglycemia. I take, you know, the blood of someone, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, and I inject it into somebody else and now et cetera, et cetera. You get this magnification. It's just positive feedback. So I believe in the fullness of time we will come to view prion disease as an aberration of homeostasis in the other direction where the positive feedback loop was turned on inappropriately at the wrong time and is out of control. And I think it's not a coincidence that small molecules that we're finding from our approach tweaking allosteric sites in these assembly machines is the most potent compound that, uh, uh, you know, available at the moment. Yes? So how does all this apply to autoimmunity? Well, uh, so what we have, it's ne we've never published this, but uh, what we found when we were working on regulation of the ribosome membrane junction, I just have that as one little panel in, my, in one of my early slides, it, is that immunoglobulins are distinctive uh, in going through what we at the time called an open ribosome membrane junction. That's one in which uh, uh, the nascent chain, you know, uh, gets targeted to the endoplasmic reticulum and it starts to go into the ER lumen and then the junction opens and thousands of Daltons of nascent chain spew out into the cytoplasm talk to the cytosol in ways that have not, no one has defined, and then suck it all back in and close the junction. There is crosstalk that has been, it's not being explored. Uh, since 
I left academia, I recently looked it up. There have been zero papers on the ribosome membrane junction following up our two papers in cell, you know, a, 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 very, a very productive direction on regulation of the immune response hasn't been pursued. Uh, so I believe that uh, an assembly machine governs opening and closing of that junction, and that would be an interesting place to look for a range of immune modulatory functions. Yes. If I comprehended at least part of the slide, when the, in the assembly machines operate, there, there's more granularity to it than is commonly assumed. Is that oh, oh, uh, yes, and we're just scratching the surface. You know, a, a small number of the assembly machines involved in a small number of viruses have been well character, or you know, well have been characterized to more than a trivial extent. We know that the assembly machines apply to all this other stuff, but there's a hundred years of work to do. Now, the good news is I don't need to have done that in order to advance small molecules that are therapeutic. And that's obviously the flip side of, well, why do this in a company rather than academia? This is the best way to see this actually go somewhere. At the very end, you mentioned um, the development of biomarkers and yes. patient stratification for, you know, that's a huge buzzword that's yes. personalized medicine now. Do you have any ideas about developing what would be a predictive companion diagnostic that would go alongside the uh, Well, absolutely. We believe, in fact, we're working with um, uh, um, a company uh, in Maryland, actually, uh, Oconee Biosystems, that has a very nice diagnostic platform. What I like about their platform, unlike any of the others that I'm aware of, is they print their chips on plastic, not silicon or glass. And that lowers the cost enormously and brings up the possibility of a test that would be a buck a piece. What? You know, uh, that would be a, a revolutionary in its own regard. Uh, um, so we're working with them to uh, take these antibodies we're developing to the normal and aberrant machines, put those on their chips, uh, see whether we can detect in peripheral blood uh, markers, because uh, uh, I believe the aberrant machines, while they may manifest in your brain, they're actually showing up in other organs that, you know, don't show up as disease. So a peripheral blood sample with a uh, buffy coat would give you that, uh, that snapshot. So that's, that, that's our plan to, to uh, develop that. Rob? You, you threw out this number of uh, 10,000 different yes. assembly machines and I don't know if that's a hard number or a soft one but just taking that as a reference there are only 20,000 proteins supposedly proteins in the cell um, so obviously these are recombinants I mean they're combinatoric yeah, well, yes. Because you, you have six or eight different subunits in each one. So how many basic proteins do you think are involved in creating the alphabet that generates all this com these complexes? Well, I, you're, you're asking a question that uh, obviously is a holy grail, not one that I have an answer to. But I, can, uh, I, I, could, I would make some observations. Uh, as I mentioned for... Uh, 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 in uh, at least, what now, three or four model systems, we've shown that one polypeptide folded different ways by the cell, not by us, has different functions. So uh, there's one dimension of that potential heterogeneity. And, and, and you have to ask, when are you asking this question? Are you asking that question today or a hundred million years from now, because I believe that 
you know, whatever, maybe a billion years ago, maybe it was the case that there's, there was an enormous amount of misfolding going on, meaning proteins that folded into junk, inclusion bodies. Uh, I think the driving force of evolution is to say, surely there's some use for this stuff, because if I find one, I've got a selective advantage over everybody who hasn't. And uh, I believe that there are multiple conformers. I, as I mentioned, the prion protein, we found at least three. Uh, a protein involved in prostate cancer, we found a half a dozen, one of which is a growth factor that appears in, in every sample we got from the UCSF prostate cancer clinic, uh, uh, peripheral blood as well as tissue. I mean, these are, and yet no one is aware, you know, when I sent that manuscript to science, it was returned unreviewed. To nature, it was returned unreviewed. To cancer cell, I got the courtesy of a one-line response from the editor saying, we aren't going to send your paper out to review because we fail to see the relevance to cancer. Excuse me. I'm showing you a growth factor in clinical specimens? I'm just saying, I think when you are dealing with something where I don't know what you're talking about. This doesn't make any sense. Nobody else is talking about these ideas. Okay, fine, I won't. Uh, so that's one dimension of this heterogeneity. But another one is what, what I showed you uh, um, uh, in one of the slides that's in a, taken from a, a paper we published uh, last year in, in the PNAS, uh, showing that heterogeneity in brain uh, on the, the glycerol gradient that only uh, an incredibly tiny percentage of that one protein is in the rabies assembly machine. Uh, uh, yeah, there are a hundred other machines using that protein. Uh, I don't know uh, uh, how that comes together. I don't know how heterogeneous. Now, uh, uh, let me just give you some parameters to realize how mind-boggling this question is. On the one hand, the total number, number of possible folded states of your typical protein is about 10 to the 50th, which is, I'm told, is greater than the total number of molecules in the known universe. Now, as uh, most uh, 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 you know, physical chemists will quick to point out, that almost all of those are energetically impossible. Well, so what does energetically impossible mean? And as a subtext here, let's point out that what, 35% of the ATP we use is sodium potassium ATPase? Well, why? That's the way it evolved, I guess. I mean, I don't know what the answer is, but you know, imagine, okay, if I, why is my phone suspended here in thin air? Oh, well, wait a minute, it's not. I can see your hand holding it. Well, what if there are mechanisms that we can't see that maintain, through input of energy, uh, a non-thermodynamically stable state, even transiently? That how long do you need your key to hold shape in order to open that lock? I, 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 you know, ask evolution that, and I can tell you, evolution has proven itself awfully ingenious at doing all sorts of stuff. So. I can't answer your question. I know it's a larger number than 20,000 genes. I would imagine it's an order of magnitude more or two. I hope not more than that or I'm not going to live to see you know, uh, a large part of that. Uh, but again, a billion years from now, I don't know what species will rule the, maybe the cockroaches will rule the earth and uh, have appropriate, I don't you know. I can't answer your question, but I believe it's a fundamental uh, a, a, a one and important to understanding biology. Yes. 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 Have you actually had enough uh, material to actually identify? Yes, we've done mass some, spec analysis yeah. of all those bands. What's uh, uh, so we know what they are. And what's interesting is, uh, in a number of cases, they are components of the interactomes that people talk about involved in a disease process. It's like, wait a minute. 
we're pulling that out on our drug resin and that's what everybody is saying is the interactome? They don't know that they're together. We're getting them together before they fall apart. So again, it adds to my confidence in favor of what is otherwise a, some would say a pretty crazy idea. Besides the fact that I also have drugs that actually work. So second question, yeah. do you have some compounds that enhance the uh, beta amyloid yes. formation? Are those similar to any environmental You know, uh, we've not done uh, uh, that. Uh, that's a good question. We've not looked. Uh, uh, you know, we've not done an exhaustive search. That's not, again, it's not something I or my colleagues have expertise in. Right. That's, uh, you know, I, I, that would be a very interesting study to do. Uh, um, well, I guess the first thing we're going to do, uh, assuming that our A-beta uh, oligomer lowering compound protects the mice at the Buck Institute, uh, we'll then come back with the other one, see whether it worsens it. If it does, then that would be an excellent question because uh, you know another way to go with this is to identify what are the environmental things that are causing. I, you know, I, I certainly uh, think that's an interesting thought process. Well, thank you so much for speaking. With us. Thanks for inviting me.